Hey YouTube, today we'll be talking about masculinities. That was a nice sound effect, Kaylee. Subtle. Very subtle. Now, before we get into the dirty details of masculinities, it's important that we define a few basic concepts. First things first, when we talk about traits like masculinity and femininity, we're talking about characteristics, behavior, and traditional roles that are typically associated with but don't exclusively belong to one gender or another. For example, in the United States, traits like dominance, ambition, strength, rationality, and independence are all traditionally considered masculine, while traits like submissive, emotional, passive, and nurturing are traditionally considered feminine. Note that many of the masculine traits are typically considered positive, while many of the feminine traits have a negative connotation, and that while these associations are slowly shifting, they're deeply ingrained within our collective conscious. Now we'll get into the hows and whys of this in a later video. For now, just take note of the fact that many of these ascribed characteristics fall in line with traditional ideas of gender roles for the sexes, or rather responsibilities that are typically assigned to one gender or another, like men being the providers and women taking care of the home. It's foundation for that hilarious joke, get back in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. I'm still laughing about that. But today we'll just begin by looking at masculinity. Now masculinity can best be understood as the way in which males construct the category men and themselves as its members, while at the same time understanding that masculinity is not exclusive to the biologically male body alone. Masculinity, masculine attributes, and the construction of what it means to be a man varies across different cultures, locations, and time. This means that what is considered masculine in the United States might not necessarily be considered masculine in, say, India. However, masculinity doesn't just vary across regional locations, but can vary between different groups inhabiting the same space. For example, black masculinity might look different than Native American masculinity, might look different than white masculinity, might look different, and so on. Class location also plays an important part in the development of masculinities, as people in higher socioeconomic statuses are able to afford and access different kinds of masculinity than people who are of low or socioeconomic status. It's for this reason that when we talk about masculinity, we talk about it in the form of masculinities in the plural, because there's always more than one way of masculine performance. Uh, performance? Is this like a dance recital or something? Not quite. When we talk about masculinity and femininity or something like gender being a performance, we're talking about how people do gender through appearance, body maintenance, behaviors, gestures, and vocal signifiers. A really great example of this would be drag shows, where people will dress in gendered clothing and adopt gendered behaviors that are typically not associated with their own gender identity. So drag queens will theatrically perform femininity, while drag kings will theatrically perform masculinity. And when we're talking about performing masculinities in general, we're talking about the ways, the where's and the when's different masculinities are enacted to prove belonging to the category of men. For example, in the United States, some of the ways in which masculinity is proven is through aggression and violence, proving usually heterosexual prowess, working out, drinking, competition, or as the ever amusing art of manliness states, providing, protecting, and procreating. I also think there's something about communing with nature and not bathing in there, but I'm not entirely sure. A really great example of this in mainstream media would be American football, a sport that excludes the participation of women and is a perfect example of organized aggression and violence. With proper padding, of course. Now at this point you're probably thinking, okay Kaylee, I can see how masculinity might be a performance, but how does this whole multiple masculinities thing work? Or maybe you weren't wondering that at all actually, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. This is Gaston. He's the best thing to happen to manhood since Theodore Roosevelt. He's got the bulging arms, hairy chest, and he's especially good at expectorating, which is spitting for those of us who aren't dictionaries. What a guy. Unfortunately for the rest of the men in his town, Gaston's perfection is unmatched, meaning that the rest of them are doomed to be disappointed if they compare their masculinity to that of Gaston's. I mean, there's no one in town half as manly. So where does this leave poor Tom, Dick, and Stanley? Well, because we can't all be Gaston's, there has to be more than one form of masculinity which there is. A hierarchy, if you will, of masculinities, with the Gastons of the world sitting at the top and everyone else not. Now we can divide this hierarchy into four basic categories. Hegemonic, complicit, marginalized, and subordinated. And because masculinity is about the power relations between men and other men, as well as between men and women, these multiple masculinities are in constant competition with each other. So at the top of the food chain sits the Gastons of the world, or in technical terms, the hegemonic masculinities, which simply put, is the kind of masculinity that is most revered within a particular group. It is the ultimate ideal within a certain place and time, and is rarely ever completely attainable, but is more of a model to be aspired to. No one hits like Gaston. So hegemonic masculinity serves a dual purpose. The first is to serve as an example to men of what they should be aspiring to if they ever want to achieve true manhood. And the second is that it's representative of a culture that dominates women. <coughs> Patriarchy. But we'll get into that later. Next down the ladder we have complicit masculinities, which describes men who benefit from but don't enact hegemonic masculinity. Which means that they don't necessarily share the same characteristics that are associated with hegemonic masculinity, but in some way benefit from and admire it. A great example of this from Beauty 
and the Beast would be LeFou. He's almost the exact opposite of Gaston in appearance and abilities, but he still gains status from his association with him. And I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he admires him. He, he has a whole song about it. Next, we have marginalized masculinities and subordinated masculinities. Now, marginalized masculinities are men who have gender privilege and may enact certain aspects of hegemonic masculinity, such as aggression and violence, but are marginalized by other factors, such as their race or class. While subordinated masculinities are men who are oppressed by definitions of hegemonic masculinity. Examples of this would be gay men who don't enact heterosexuality, or men who are considered effeminate, physically weak, or emotional. Yet no matter where men land on the hierarchy of masculinities, they all benefit in varying degrees by the patriarchy. Or in other words, their gender provides them with certain benefits, although depending on their place within the hierarchy, these benefits aren't always equal. Now in later videos, we'll be discussing these benefits in more detail, as well as some ways in which masculinity is policed and constructed by men and women. However, for now, this was just a brief introduction into the study of masculinities. As always, if you want to learn more, there will be links in the description below, and feel free to ask questions in the comments. This week's question is, what are some other examples of hegemonic, complicit, subordinated, or marginalized masculinities in the media or in your life? Next week, we'll be discussing femininity, but until then, happy unlearning.